My name is Karen Gellemutter. I'm the curator here at the Carnegie Center. And welcome to all of you who have been here before, all of you who may be new. We're glad to have you here. Um, thank you for coming out this evening. And I want to introduce Penny Sisto, who um, I'm sure you all know, but we've had the privilege of working on several exhibits with Penny before, and it's always um, an absolute wonder. So we really appreciate her being willing to share her experiences and her stories about the artworks in the exhibit. And then we're also pleased to have Anthony Redfeather Nava with us this evening, and he's going to share some of the Native American stories and perspectives about um, some of Penny's pieces in, in the exhibit as well. So, um, this is the last piece that I did for this show. And I did it because, as you know, I work in fabric. And it is very difficult to make emotion rise out of fabric. Even though fabric is used all over the world, the first thing we are swaddled in by our mothers or the midwife at birth. And when we die, our loved ones tie, at least where I come from, tie your jaw shut with fabric and wind you in it to lay you in the ground. So I wanted to see fabric weep, weep real tears. Um, several of my sons run their own construction stuff and some of them are plumbers also. And I had watched them, and they're kind of thick heads. So I thought if they can make tax wheat, I can make fabric wheat. <laughs> so um, I got some basic plumbing supplies and a couple of mannequins off eBay. And when Richard left for his jazz gig, I took his chainsaw and chainsawed them into little pieces so I could place them how I wanted. And I ran the holes up through them. and. Um, made him weep. Um, on the back of that man, I wanted them to look like mummies, spirits, as if we had come across them unexpectedly and were not really allowed to linger. And the badger on him, my eldest daughter, Anna, who is a lawyer, she, um, she gave me that for my birthday a couple of years ago. And, and there it is. And she came up to me and says, Mother, like that, when she saw it. Because I'm always hard to shop for, they tell me. So um, I turned 70 this year, and she gave me nothing. <laughs> but the year I turned 50, they gave me five mouse mummies that they found in my butter chair and up in the attic. It, it was like the Roach Motel. We have roaches in our house. So the Roach Motel, they go in, but they can't get out. And the mice had gone into my chair and couldn't get out, so I put him on a quilt. Someone bought it. <laughs> and on the back of the young woman, because we stand here, where numbers of trails of tears have passed us, every footstep we take walks in their footsteps, or the footsteps of those who once owned this land. We stand on hallowed ground. And I wanted these two figures to portray that in some way. The young woman has roots from a sycamore tree that a son-in-law of mine found uh, in the creek. And I liked it because it looks like she's carrying her family's roots on her back. Because I'm a stranger in a different land. And they were going to a different land. And you have to find your roots within yourself. And those moccasins I made a few years ago out of the leather my husband was wiping his car with. <laughs> and um, they started falling apart, so I put them on the yeah. This piece is about a weaver. And sadly, another birthday present is, is in her weaving. Um, another daughter went to visit a friend of hers and bought that beautiful purse, and I pulled it apart to make this quilt. <laughs> I wanted her sunshiny face, see how she looks like she's in the sun, because when you're weaving or quilting or basket making, um, they tell me that your brain waves change and become very serene and happy. So I wanted her face to meld into the sun. Um. One of the things about Navajo, my stepfather is Navajo Indian, and uh, it's, it's really amazing what these women actually do with the weaving. I 
mean, they raise these, these sheep from uh, babies. They treat them like they're children. They uh, care for them. The family herds them. And then they go out and they gather all these different plants that are local to create the colors for the weaving. So then they take the wool, they treat it, they spin it, they dye it. And there's so much work that goes into these rugs. And it's what I was told one time from a Navajo weaver, it's uh, basically, it's you that you're putting into this weaving. And so it's a very small piece of them. So yeah, I can see why she's smiling in this picture because of everything that she's done to this, uh, uh, this weaving. This, this is a, a very sacred story to the Lakota uh, type ceremony. Uh, before the white buffalo calf woman came, uh, there were basically two males that were out hunting and they seen this beautiful woman. <coughs> and one was very lustful and he wanted her. So uh, the other male protected her from his friend and uh, she rewarded him. And it's a very long story, so I'm just kind of briefly going over this. So in uh, doing this, she presented him a sacred pipe for him to use uh, for prayer. And she said, now, I want you to take this to your people and this is how you use this pipe. And she says, for doing this, the seventh sons of the seventh generation may see peace by my return. And the sign is born a white buffalo. Now, how many of you in the news have uh, seen the birth of a white buffalo here within the past few years? There's been several of them. But none of them have been what we call the true white buffalo. Uh, a white buffalo is not an albino misconception. Uh, a true white buffalo will have normal hooves, nose, eyes, and they won't be pink or miscolored. So uh, we're waiting for the return because this is the time of the seventh generation. And in this, she said that when this white buffalo appears, it'll be born white, and it will change to all of the sacred colors of man red, white, yellow, black, and then back to white. So we're waiting for those buffaloes to change. And when they do, it says that this will be a, a piece that man, woman, <laughs> mankind, will have learned to live in peace with one another. So this is a, a fairly uh, well-known story among a lot of Plains people. So uh, there is a sacred pipe. It's a very old pipe, and there were seven of them that were actually copied from the original. And very few people know where these pipes are at, but they're out there. And uh, if, you're, if you're ever at the right place in the right time, hopefully, uh, I may be one day, I may see one. So. Well, it came with big snow last winter. A, a few years ago, um, one of my children who came in uh, gave birth in the great big snowstorm. Something big always happens in a big snowstorm at our house. And baby Ollie was born in a huge storm. And luckily, the birth went so beautifully. Else we couldn't have gotten out anyway. But um, came the big snowstorm this last winter, and I was um, dying to make a piece. And I needed foil, because in this show, I don't know if you noticed, I got kind of wild about doing foil and some metal and the pieces. And I didn't have any, but I was roasting a beef, and I looked at the Reynolds aluminum foil, <laughs> on bingo. So this piece is all underlaid with Reynolds aluminum. It's not the one I use for the beef, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted it so peaceful, and he is just riding his horse, uh, into the creek and leaving the village. And if you can look, I'll shout. Um, behind his head when you go up, feel free to touch the quotes if I'm around. Um, you can see white buffalo calf in 
in the sky behind the rainbow. Oh. Yeah, this is a piece about Chief Joseph. I, I am in awe of that man. Um, and I made that piece very quickly. And the strip of fabric, a lot of the pieces in this show, I have to move while I speak, I hope you can hear me. Um, I use the shape of the cross and a circle and uh, this piece is a piece from one of our old teepees because in this area they don't last so many years because of all the snow and humidity. So you will see this cross theme and a circle in, in most of the pieces up in that show. A crazy horse and his crazy horse. Um, again, working on this piece was very frightening to me because he has an enormous spirit and he chose to be secretive about what he looked like so I felt um, that I had to tread very carefully. I had, read, I had read that he was fairly light complexioned and a man of not huge stature but immensely powerful where he stood and that he put uh, on his face sacred spots and a lightning bolt and he wore a dark red medicine bag. I've got, uh, I've got a story for you about this. <laughs> um, one's funny and another one's serious, so we'll go with the serious one. Uh, Crazy Horse is actually, uh, is we, we have several names uh, when we are uh, going from child to adult. Uh, we have the name that our family calls us, and then we have the name that our people call us. Uh, before he was Crazy Horse, he was known as Curly Hair, because his hair was actually uh, very wavy. And uh, my story, <laughs> which is pretty funny, um, I don't know the, how to... I can't remember how to pronounce it, but I used to sit on a native drum, and uh, we were doing a song, and it was about Crazy Horse, and a Lakota elder came up to us, and they said, you said drunk horse. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, uh, there's a very slight glottal when you say his name one way, and say the name another way. One is crazy, and the other one is drunk. <laughs> so, uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. So. Um, I, I just, I like to prove to people that you can make quilts out of anything, even old hair bones. And this, to me, looked like an altar piece. Um, the elder's eyes are filled with learning, and he pulls us in, and from his head, I wish the court was here so I could touch it, from his head you see a, a crow in profile in its eye and his hair becomes its wings and the wisdom of the crow comes from it. And here is a crow um, kneeling in prayer. Mm. And I put crow drawings on the cow bones. Uh, to me, uh, as I was working on it, it was an altarpiece. Um, many crows in the woods where I live and one day I was driving to the bottom of our driveway to take um, Bethany who's our youngest um, to school to Floyd Central and we found crows uh, pecking to death a young red-tailed hawk so um, I was still in my goonie gown, my nightgown and my rubber boots and I had a PLO man's scarf around my head she used to hate me taking her to school. <laughs> and one day she said to me, I'm not kissing you goodbye. I'm so pissed that you're wearing your PLO thing and your melty boots and your boonie. And I said, I will follow you into school for that kiss. And she disbelieved me and headed for her locker. I followed her and I got my kiss. <laughs> but we um, thought we had rescued the red-tailed hawk and to drive the rest of the way I put it under my jersey, my uh, grinny, to keep it uh, warm. And I could feel her heart beating against mine. And then driving up the driveway, I flew to her, and it was gone. Mm -hmm.
hawks. So um, many of the red-tailed hawk feathers we use um, in a holy way came from her. May she fly. Uh, I'm a Yaki, and I'm also a Cherokee Indian, and uh, this is my people. Uh, every uh, spring, right at Easter, matter of fact, Easter Sunday, we have deer dances. So uh, in this tradition, we have the, the uh, deer dancer that comes in. We have uh, a people called Koshais uh, that are uh, like saints. Uh, when the, when the Jesuits came in, we kind of demonized them a little bit for what they did to us. And um, with this, um, when we have the deer dance ceremonies, one of the things that happens is for a male to attend a deer dance ceremony, first of all, you have to be a part of a certain society to even do the dance. Uh, second of all, if you're not within that society, uh, that Deer Dance Society, then in order to <clears throat> go to the ceremony, the Deer Dance, uh, for instance, like my wife would have to escort me there, and she would have to uh, bind herself to me in some way, shape, or form, whether holding a hand, uh, tying maybe if she wore a sash, a piece of that sash to me, because in our tradition it says that these ceremonies are so powerful that a male could be lost and maybe transform into a deer and never be seen again. So, uh, oh, electric smoke signal. Not a cell phone. It's electric smoke signal. Uh, so, uh, you know, this this is um, a lot of preparation. Usually, uh, several weeks in advance uh, when when we do the deer dance. And uh, it, it usually goes through all of our pueblos. So we have uh, uh, many pueblos that range from northern Mexico into uh, southern Arizona. Uh, so uh, you know, all, all at the same time, all the pueblos kind of uh, do their ear dances. So I call this piece Esperanza, meaning hope. And again, the circle and the elder and the grandchild and the mountain range make a cross within a circle, which is the Celtic cross, which is the symbol I was raised under. The joining of a circle, which is my people's old ways, and the joining of a cross, which the Christians brought to us. Um, and in the sky are the four directions, red, yellow, black, and white. And the elder, holds the future, the grandchild up, to present to us a hope-filled future. Because I was careful to make the mountains and the background here, our past, very dark. We have a shame-filled past, many of us, if we follow our lines. Um, we did not treat this land with all that we should have. But here, light begins to and make its way like rivers into the darkness. And then the future is a patchwork where we join together and walk forward in a beautiful pattern. And I put it on a buffalo skin. <coughs> this is the fourth um, buffalo piece I've made. Um, I start each morning praying um, in a circle. The circle I pray in at my house is a teepee. At my grandmother's house, it was a rock cairn. Um, the Orkney Islands have the oldest dwellings in the British Isles, the Pitcairn houses, which are circular. And every time we wanted to cleanse ourselves, we did it in what we call a rock cairn sauna, or in America you would say sauna. You heat the rocks in the peat stove, um, put them in the sauna, and cover it with sheepskin and seaweed and toss seawater, and it is a beautiful thing to do. I, I do it to this day with my family. Um, so a circle come easy to me, and I was kneeling one morning and saying to God, hey, guess what, God? Today I'm going to do a 
quilt and I'm going to put it on a cow skin because I had a cow skin in the studio. And God spoke into my heart and said, why not a buffalo? And I said, are you dumb? We killed them all. And, and God was silent. And I went into the house, and this is very early in the morning, very early, 4.30 to 5 o'clock in the morning. And the telephone rang, and I quick picked it up and said, yeah. And the man's voice said, hey, sister, did you know a buffalo farm has opened up at Elizabeth, Indiana, not 20 minutes from your door? And my heart leapt, and I said, is this God? <laughs> and he says, no, it's Bob. Bob Williams, your neighbor. Uh, just you know. He hung up. So I drove over there, and by about seven in the morning, I was ding, 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 on the door, and they said, were chips opened? And I said, yeah, but someone special told me. And, and I bought a first buffalo robe, and I made a quote on it. And they charged me $500 for the robe. Yeah, they're expensive. Please buy this And And then I, I did it really fast because I worked fast. And I went back for another. And I dink dink on the door. And I said, I've come for a second one of your $500 buffalo robes. And they said, the price went up. So $1,000. Oh. So I just drove home and I flipped it over and I put the second quilt on the back of that. <laughs> I'm Scottish. We, we, cats don't like to spread the money to other people. <laughs> um, it's really odd. You were talking about the Celtic cross <clears throat> and a lot of the native culture, we have the same symbol circle with a cross on the inside and medicine wheel. So uh, that, you know, it's, it's what I try to tell people is we are all tied some way, shape, or form culturally to one another. <coughs> it's just that we have to open our eyes wide enough to find these similarities. And getting back to these colors, red, white, yellow, black, if we went back uh, B.C. before Columbus and the world was flat and we have Europe, Africa, Asia and the Americas. We have the red nation, the white nation in Europe, the black nation in Africa, and the yellow nation in Asia. Why? Maybe these people were coming here visiting us and vice versa. But the circle never ends, never begins life. That's how things are always. When we die, our story continues and our children it still lives. Think about your ancestors and their story because without one of them, you would be gone. You would not even exist. So we are the oldest living story in a continuing story. And our story lives through our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And um, this is the fancy show dance. Um, to me, um, women are pierced. I made holes in this. Women are pierced. Come on now, women. Back me up. We are pierced from the outside inwards when we accept love and from the inside outwards when we give birth. And so often in the quotes I leave woman holes in them that are open. Can you say woman home from the microphone? Um, I'm a midwife. Um, and on this piece, I wanted it to be woman moon, woman holes, and uh, fabric that has touched women from all kinds of lands. So um, there is a piece from the Hmong people here, a Mexican tablecloth, an Irish table linen. Um, this round circle here was the top of a Muslim man's hat, and this piece here was the rim that went around. This came back from Vietnam. Uh, the green is a wedding, a wedding robe of a Tibetan man who I met in Santa Fe, and he gave me his wedding robe. 
Um, this was one of grandson's Halloween costumes a few years ago. So, many, many. And we have in our presence a champion, fancy show dance. You weren't supposed to tell people that. Uh, as a Native American Indian, a lot of times we uh, poke fun at things. So at a powwow, uh, or wasipi, we have a, uh, a time that we call a switch dance. So as a men's traditional dancer, uh, I've got a, an adopted sister who's Hopi. And uh, a lot of times we would end up going to the powwows and being the head man and head lady. So we would have to lead these dances. Uh, Sometimes she would dress one way, sometimes she would dress another. So unfortunately, that day, she was a fancy shawl. So I had to dress like a fancy shawl. <coughs> well, it's kind of funny because I've been dancing for so many years, I know a lot of the, the footwork and the different steps because I may have uh, judged a competition or, you know, just seen it. So, um, yeah, I got to explore my inner fancy dancer. So here I am, I'm out in a, uh, a powwow arena with my shawl, and I'm spinning and I'm turning, and I'm doing all the footwork, and I take that competition. Oh. But I also get a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did it. The fancy shawl actually, uh, it's, it's more one of our uh, recent dances. Uh, it didn't really come into play until, oh, probably about 1930s, early 40s. And how it evolved is kind of like what's going on now with the women's grass dancers. So uh, the, uh, the fancy shawl is an adaptation of the men's fancy dance. So a lot of times when you see these guys and they're bright colored, I'm talking about chartreuse, orange, greens, and they're out there and they're spinning and they're jumping down and they've got their sticks and they're, you know, pairing and turning. A lot of times you see these guys on TV and they're very quick, they're very fluid, they have a lot of rhythm work. The women said, okay, we want some attention too. So they started adapting their shawls which is one of the main components as a woman dancer. They always have to cover their shoulders, or they always have to have a shawl with them over their arm. So when this happened, the women were like, okay, we're gonna start putting the bright colored ribbons on our shawls. We're gonna develop the same footwork that the men are using, but we're gonna put it on our level. Uh, the uh, fancy shawl, uh, it's known as a butterfly dance because it actually, when you see these women and they kind of turn, it almost looks like a butterfly with its wings open. So uh, I, I want to tell you right now, this was really a very good artistic view on this, and I got to like pat you on the back. I'll hug you later. Uh, but uh, this this is really, I mean, this is what you see. Okay, you see the bright colors. Uh, this is what I like, because even as a, a, a woman, there's still modesty as a, as a Native woman. And a lot of times they don't show maybe nothing but a wrist or neck up. But in a fancy shawl, you know, uh, the shawl is still covering. So that is, is part of this. So there's, there's wonderful things about this quilt. Very much like it. Oh, Chirunimo. <laughs> so, um, I know nothing about history. I have five years um, of pretty poor schooling, and I have, ne have never, till I came to America, heard the name uh, Native American or, or any of the men and women elders. But the first time I heard the name Geronimo, 
something about the cadence of it um, made my soul stop still. And, and then I saw a photograph of him, and he looked so like my people. Uh, it's a big, big old square head, cheekbones. Um, he, there was something in the way he carried his body, the spirit inside his body that resonated with me. I, ha I have uh, seven children from my body who are still alive, and two who are dead, Bethany's twin and Romilly. And 26 grandkids, so I've done great damage to her. <laughs> but every summer we go, and most of us stay in one house for one week. I, I work all year for this week. It, it's the best week on the planet, I think. Um, and it's always in, in Florida, so I can be near the ocean and the grandkids and the family can swim. And one time I was there, and somebody walking past me on the beach began a conversation and said um, something about Geronimo. And I stopped and I listened carefully. And he said, yeah, yeah, Fort Pickens, down the road a couple of miles. They held Geronimo there. And he said this with great pride. And I walked back to the house, and one of the kids said, we, we can take you, it's just a short drive. So we gathered together some feathers and some tobacco and, and some gifts. And we went to there, but when we got to the gateway of it, it is not a pleasant place to go. Um, I show it in the background of the quilt just really small with a straight line road coming to it and that road on his horizon makes a cross. And, and, and we went there and I did not want to go inside this, this stone building because it was a fort. But we knelt at the door house and made some prayers and dug a hole and dropped some tears and the gifts. And then I went back a year later with a daughter, a son-in-law, and a granddaughter. And as we walked to the gatehouse, I said, let's not take our car any further. We will walk, and I will show you the place Geronimo lived here. And we walked to a certain place that was filled with thorn plants, Cherokee bean and long thorns. And I said, I can feel him here and I see four women with him. And we went to the gatehouse where they have research, people who research your questions. And I said, why is he accompanied by four women? And the man looked on his computer and looked through some old um, film. And he said, oh, four of his wives were here with him. And I said, why are their feet bleeding? And he read more and he said, because seven hours a day they were given a machete and they had to cut down the thorns. And by then my granddaughter and my daughter Becky were re weeping. And so they went away from that uh, front desk and I followed them. And we walked to the place he was and my daughter and her daughter walked barefoot. And when we got back to the car, I pulled so many thorns from their feet and they did not even blink and they said if Geronimo and the women could walk seven hours a day we can walk half an hour and I found that as moving to me as holy communion so in this quote I, I don't have a father um, I'm a child of incest. If I could choose a father, this one. Hey, see that little silk? I had some leftover silk, so I thought, hmm. and, and I put that doorway really high up and really tiny, so nobody, no kid at the opening could get inside it. Boy, I haven't been at the opening 10 minutes, and Sally came up and said, <clears throat> like that and kind of gesture and there's 
one of my rambunctious grandsons in there tearing the place up. <laughs> um, all my life I have been plagued with owls. Sorry, owl people. Um, they always appear to me. They always seem to like me. Um, I, I was awakened by my dog, Bardo, real early one morning, bark, bark, bark. So even for me, it was very early, and I went out, and he rushed to the floor of the TV, and there standing in the doorway where my daughter Becky had many owl feathers from a roadkill owl hanging on the doorway, so each time we go in, we get brushed with the owl. It was a huge owl. She stand about as high as my knee, just standing in the teepee doorway looking out at me. And I, I said, are you a spirit person or a real person? But the dog was... Rah, rah, rah. So I said, would you please wait here a few minutes? I'm going in the house to wake my husband and have him take a photo. <laughs> and I ran in, I woke him up. And he works as a musician very late, so he was not best pleased. And he came out with my little, really junky uh, camera that's years old. And he took a photo of her. And then I said, would you let me touch you? And I was still my goonie, like I took that into to school in. And, and she let me hold her wings. And we walked, walked, walked. And <coughs> she flew away. Um, and last time we were in the TV doing Healing Circle, um, I never know who will turn up at healing circle. Sometimes just a few of us, sometimes many people. Um, but many Latina women had come that evening, and one of them asked to stay in the teepee afterwards for a private talk because uh, her job entailed a lot of kneeling and her knees had become so inflamed and painful. So she was sitting there with me and I say, oh, but there's a woman outside the door wanting to speak to you. And I described to her the woman. And she began to weep and said, um, that's my grandmother uh, who died right after I left home. And she said, my grandmother always promised me she would come in the shape of an owl. And at that moment, on the top branches of the TV, a thud and then the screech of an owl, and we look up through the smokestack, and a big owl is sitting there for this young woman. So I'm always looking for an eagle feather, but I always catch owls. Um, so I, I dream very rarely, maybe three, four times a year I dream. And so I listen carefully. And this night I dreamed, the night before I made this quote, of a circle of dancers and singers. And then the arena lifts, and a very old lady comes in, bent over, and she begins to change into an owl. And she came level with me and grew enormous till her head was here. And I said, Grandmother, why do you walk all crippled over like that? And see how she has one owl hand and one human hand holding stones. She said, I walk this way because of the stones. Now a week before, or a year before this happened, I was driving, always on the quest for this immortal eagle, who I'll probably see the day I die. And a truck ahead of me with some yahoo in it hit what I thought was an eagle, and feathers flew, and a big body flew and crashed to the side of the road where the gravel is. And I stopped, damn you. Um, and I thought, please don't let this be an eagle that I wish death upon. And I knelt down, and sh she was still sh shivering with life, but her face was down. So I put one hand under to feel her heart and turned her over. And I bent down, and it was a, an owl. And our breaths were coming into each other. And her eyes grew, grew black with death. And as she died, her claws crutched like this two pieces of gravel. Um, I took her body home, and our smudge fan is her wing and her claw, still with a stone in it. So 
I think the dream was the spirit of that woman who walks that way because of the stones. This piece, anyone in the room who's a quilter, this piece started off as a piece of uh, orange organza. You've really got to pick at this piece when you go up, just, just ever so gently, because it's got about 11 or 12 layers, because the orange looked pretty but flimsy, so then I put more fabric on, and then I cut some of the fabric away, then I painted it, then I photocopied it, then I sprayed it, then I put um, crackle medium on it, then I crackled it, then I put foil on it, and lastly, a beautiful piece of metal from that the creek rusted an old tea kettle, and it's the bottom of the tea kettle. And this piece talks about how the woman looks across this landscape, and the mountain is the spirit of the mountain lion, and she has her, she's looking far. Yeah, that's a good, good piece to examine all the layers in. I know nothing about mountain lion energy. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll have to talk about this one more. Uh, a few years back, I had a, a very uh, unique change of life. Um, I developed seizures, and I was having uh, really nasty seizures. And uh, Animals, as a native person, sometimes show you things about yourself, and uh, I don't want to see this one again. Uh, this mountain lion, to me, is really a part of me that I just don't care to go back. Uh, these doctors were placing me on all these medications. Uh, weird stuff, and it's like some of them, the side effects were worse than what I had. Uh, I've always had dreams about deer. Uh, deer is very strong with me, and uh, that's another story. So, but uh, this chick right here, my life was chaos. My life was uh, a whirlwind, and I had a dream that I started off as, a, as just human form and I was running and the next thing you know, I jumped. And when I jumped, I found myself in a field as a deer. So I was running through the field and I could, and this was a wild dream, I could hear the grass and the air move past. And then I came to another part where I jumped again and that's where this one picked up. And ever since then, my life was kind of chaotic. And uh, I met my wife. <laughs> and uh, she got me better. And uh, when that happened, this one left. And uh, I haven't seen her since then. Personally, I don't want to see her again. <laughs> and because of uh, what it meant for me. Uh, Everybody's interpretation of spirit animals, of medicine animals, may be a little bit different than my experience. Uh, when you talk about crow earlier, a lot of times this is one of the first medicines that people get. And eventually, it'll move to something else. Each person's different when it comes to this. And, I, and even today, I have a lot of people come up and it's, it's really, I believe, got out of hand because everybody's always looking for something. And, and there was a powwow. i got to tell this story. Uh, it was really funny because uh, this guy had been coming into the powwows for many years. And uh, he had left. But he was just more of a spectator. And all of a sudden he shows back up. And the next thing you know, a crow flies over. 
he reaches down into a backpack, he pulls out a book, and he goes, Crow, that's good medicine, all right. <laughs> all wrong. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of times, you have these animals, and they come to you, and they are guides. But what better way to guide yourself than having a piece of yourself tell you what's wrong? A lot of times people have uh, what they call uh, spirit guides. And they always say, you know, I have a spirit guide, and it's usually an old man or it's an old woman. But what a better person to guide yourself than your future self that has already learned how to avoid those problems. Because I used to have this spirit guide, and it was always an old man, and he would always wear these flannel shirts and blue jeans. And then it clicked one day. It's not an old man. It's me as an old man. So a lot of times these animals are sometimes the animal in us and, and how our lives are interpreted. So uh, my life was chaos, so therefore I was given chaos, something that is uh, wild and untamed. Um, true enough, I wanted to make a piece that was simply a strong woman standing strongly. And I had most of it pieced out and ready except the stage stick. And I said to uh, Bethany, who happened by with she and Shara's kids, I said, hmm, I need someone to make a stage stick. And she panicked during the headlights. And I said, well, uh, it's going to be on the quilt. And, and I came back in 10 minutes, and it was there, and it was beautiful. And I always say to family members, that's the best piece of art in the whole damn show, that little stage thing that my baby made. So I see that it's sold, so I owe you 10 bucks. <laughs> Being raised uh, Catholic, I always do a lot of my donors and children. Hey, and, and, and I'm always on the, the look for fabric, and I couldn't find a piece to make the baby look as though he was uh, wrapped in fur. And then I went to Unique Thrift Store. Everything. <laughs> Unique Thrift Store, even the bra. And um, I found a beach towel, and it had on it, speaking of wild things, a tiger. And I thought, yeah, that's my fur. Look. This is his muzzle with the whiskers, and there are some of his stripes. That's an old beach towel. Two dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> the rest is hand dyed silk. But <laughs> here, I'd like to go back to that one. Those are elk teeth, right, on the dress? Well, it, they're meant to be. Yes, it's made with fabric. Yeah. You know, this is a wonderful thing. This is like Indian money. You just put $100 bills all over her dress. Elk, the two front teeth, there's only two of them on there. Native people would really, I mean, kind of yelp teeth. And they're still like a really high commodity. They're ivory. So... That's why the, the Indian people want them. So the more elk tea a woman has on her dress, the higher in society within her people she is. Hey, she's like Princess Di or something. Virgin <laughs> Mary, at least. Yeah, you want to marry her. She's got some horses. <laughs> um, owls again, sorry. Um, on this piece, I wanted the owl marrying the woman and she's morphing to an owl, or the uh, owl morphing, I wasn't sure which. So, um, I made an owl bride. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I will speak about this, because prayer's my 
favorite thing. Um, end day, end life, end evenings are always begins and ends with our inner prayer. And on that, this piece, um, I wanted the old woman standing in the canyons. And you know how sometimes when you stand to pray, you can hardly keep it in your chest. So you, your hands automatically try to go to that area. And I show her praying so hard and so filled with joy that her body is disintegrating into the wind. Hey, and she looks like she's levitating. That piece she's levitating off is a piece of a shower curtain, Unix or store again. That was the best shower curtain I ever bought. If you look at that piece shade, the grass in the bottoms from that shower curtain, and the yellow sunsets from the shower curtain, and that little yellow and white piece there, shower curtain, that thing's never going to rot. <laughs> Okay, and um, I end again with the Celtic cross, uh, the mother and her cradleboard child uh, forming a cross, and no cops in here beside my daughter, right? Um, the the uh, red-tailed hawk feathers, a little bit illegal, but it's from that little hawk, um, and I rusted them to show that that which is most precious on this earth is falling away into decay, so your uh, roots must be inside, in your spirit, because only the spirit is what you take with you. And I call it protection blanket. There's shade, hey, shower curtain at the top, <laughs> and the shower curtain at the bottom, and it only cost a couple of dollars that you need. Um, if you find another one, please get it for me, it was the best piece. But I also cut up my skirt to make his shawl, his cape. And I made this piece because my husband, Richard, is Italian, um, first generation, so he's very um, emotional. Emotionally fragile, we say in our family, and very dramatic. And I took him uh, across some land, and we passed the desert out in the southwest and I said oh I love open desert because I live for a while around the Maasai desert so I love open wide space like that and I took him out and we began to walk away from the car never a good idea and I saw panic begin to grow within his body and he finally said I can't take this I can't take it this is terrifying and so I turned to him and I said, you can find shade here, just keep looking in my eyes, the shade. And so that's what I made this piece about, the shade we find only in ourselves or in another person who's walking straight. I love that piece. I love the shower curtain a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Um, on this piece, I make his heart uh, so big, so open, like a ray of light for us. And in the background, I made trees that also become prison bars. Yeah. And his spirit, as it flows from him, becomes two rivers at the bottom that join into one for our two nations in America, our many nations. We have to become one. It was really odd because Sitting Bull, before his death, he actually had a vision of how he would die. And he would always say that he would die by his own people. And one of the uh, warriors had went to work as a scout for the cavalry, and uh, that was one of them from his own people that shot and killed him. So, uh, a very great leader. A lot of times when I go into schools, I talk about great chiefs because children always associate a chief with a headdress. <coughs> But yet, in every picture that you see, Sidney Bull, he has no feathers. 
before he wears one. And this was a great chief. Uh, a lot of times what people portray as a chief with these elaborate headdresses, they're not chiefs at all. They're combat veterans. So they're giving feathers as we give medals to honor our soldiers. So these are deeds that they have done for their people. Not saying that chiefs can be the same thing and wear a headdress or a bonnet, but most of the time, a lot of the greatest chiefs that are in Native history had no feathers or very few. So uh, I always like to point that out. It, it is so strange to me how, how our cultures um, intersect in a beautiful quote because um, the highlands and the islands uh, are all filled with men who have gone to war and uh, in Gaelic they wear a, a turi, they wear a bonnet and they, if you translate it to English also it says bonnet and on it will be symbols, either a feather, um, where I live it would be puffin or golden eagle and um, also little claws, the grass's foot or a little claw because they are so grateful that their spirit survived the wars. And these are called war bonnets, the same. Yeah. Oh, I made these two soft walkers, and because um, a daughter, Becky, who couldn't be here tonight, because my eldest grandson, it's his birthday, and they're having dinner, and hopefully saving me his cake, um, <laughs> she lost twins. And... Uh, they came prematurely and as a family we gathered to burn their small bodies and um, spread their ashes. And as we sat uh, in some kind of sorrow in the teepee, uh, she saw a picture of two young men walking behind her and she was sure that was the spirit of her twins who had left the earth. And um, she felt they had a link in Florida, and she was looking a boot there one time after our annual visit to Chaos on the Beach. And she came upon a story of these people who would wear soft sea grass and feathers on their feet so that they could even walk across the sand and leave no trail. And again, the intersection of cultures, because where I grew up, uh, the warriors also who fought the darned English, um, they would tie, uh, kill a bird and wrap it on their feet so that they could walk across the snow and leave no tracks. Soft walkers, I call it. <coughs> and crows. <laughs> ha! The best name I ever heard in this lifetime was when somebody told me that the favorite daughter of Sitting Bull was called Standing Holy. And again, like when I heard the name of Geronimo, the very fact that you love enough to call someone Standing Holy um, filled me with awe. I think it's the most beautiful name I ever heard. And there's a photograph I found online of her, and she doesn't look a whole lot like that, but she looks somewhat like that. And I wanted this little lassie to be not quite meeting her eyes, because she's looking somewhere else. And that gives us the privacy to stare at her. And she is standing holy. May we all. And the last piece, again, is the about a Sioux sun dance and um, a most holy ceremony. Well, this one is a, <coughs> a rough one. Um, as a male, women are so lucky because they say that when you give birth, this is the closest to death that you come. So at this time, you're very connected with the Creator. Men, on the other hand, <coughs> have to do this. We pierce here, and we talk.
tie ourselves to a sacred tree. Usually we will fast for four days, go through purification ceremony. Then an elder pierces us with an eagle talon. We're shish kebobbed with a piece of buffalo bone and then we're tethered to a tree. And all during this time, we wear a wreath of sage. We're given an eagle whistle because during the ceremony, during certain parts, the men will lay back and what we're trying to do is we're trying to tear the flesh. So in doing this, it symbolizes being tied with an umbilical cord, in a sense, to Mother Earth, to our spiritual mother, to break these ties. To be a sun dancer is a very very great honor because usually these dancers take a four year commitment. The first year <clears throat> they abstain from all pleasure in any way, shape, or form. And they go and they pierce. Now after the first year they don't have to pierce again. They may not be asked to pierce at all. But sometime during that four-year commitment, they will pierce. They may assist the other dancers that are becoming pierced. Or they may offer flesh offerings. So they will take small pieces and cut them from their arm as a sacrifice. Sometimes the women even do this as well. So, I'm not a Kolka, but what I do know is this is taken very seriously among a lot of people from the plains. It's not just Lakota, it's Cheyenne, it's Kiowas, and other people from the plains uh, that share this tradition. Uh, sometimes they'll even pierce on the back and they'll drag a buffalo skull around the circle until it tears from their body. So. Uh, it's, it's a very unique dance. It's a very spiritual dance. And uh, a lot of times these dancers experience vision because they're so close to death. And they say that these visions are because they are connected to their creator, to our creator at that time. So information is given to us. And uh, that's it. And so this is uh, the sun dance. <coughs> so, so thank you. If anyone has questions, I think we are going upstairs, so thanks, Mika. Sweetest.